Hi guys and welcome to this week's video. Today I'll be drawing a horse in polychromos colour pencils on pastel matte paper. I gave a sneak peek of these new supplies in a haul video I uploaded a week or two ago, so if you're interested in seeing the other supplies that I bought, I'll leave a link in the cards in the top right and in the description box down below. I'll be showing you a time-lapse video of the process I took to complete this portrait, and whilst I do, I'll be providing some helpful tips on how to draw realistically, or make your work look more realistic. As always, this video is built on my own personal experiences and opinions, so let me know what you think and why you disagree if you do. I'll also be uploading another video where I give an explanation of my process, so be sure to check that one out too, and I'll put a link to it in the cards and the description box when it's live. I have to be honest, I had a hard time coming up with a video topic this week, but thanks to a commenter, Little Orc, I believe, I was inspired to do a video on this topic. So thank you very much, Little Orc, for suggesting a video about drawing realistically. And the topic and uh, drawing that I'm doing really came together when I had some comments about how realistic this drawing looked when I uploaded some work in progress shots on my social media. So if you guys have any suggestions for video topics in the future, I'm all ears, so don't forget to leave them down below in the comment section. So anyway, enough of that, let's get on to the tips. Tip number one is to always draw from a reference. I think there's this misconception, especially with younger or newer artists, that you need to be able to draw everything from memory in order to be a good artist, or that drawing from a photo reference is some form of cheating. This is absolutely not the case, and I can assure you that almost every artist that draws realistically will be drawing from some kind of photo reference. The people who can create convincing results without one are people who have had uh, years, or decades even, of industry experience. Make sure that you have permission to use the photograph that you're drawing from though, if you do plan on uploading your art to the internet, or uh, if you plan on selling it. I recommend sites such as Pixabay and Paint My Photo as sites for royalty-free, copyright-free photographs to work from. My second piece of advice is to begin with an accurate sketch or outline. I've already made a video on how to create an accurate sketch, so if you happen to have missed that, I'll leave a link to it in the cards and in the description box down below. I recommend using a few different techniques to ensure the accuracy of your sketch, but in most cases I suggest the grid method and using a tracing of the reference to check. For very important pieces that I need to be perfect, such as commissions, portraits and pet portraits, I'll trace the, uh, I'll trace the reference photo and transfer it onto my paper. And I've also made another video about tracing in general and the controversy surrounding it, so I'll leave a link to that one in the description box down below as well. But anyway, the important thing is to have the most accurate foundation for your art that you can possibly manage. I know from personal experience that it's all too tempting to jump right into the most exciting part, which is the colouring for me, but if there are any inaccuracies, they're not going to disappear when you start your colouring. The further along with the piece that you get, the more difficult it can be to correct and adjust, particularly with transparent and unforgiving permanent mediums such as markers and coloured pencils. I'm sure you don't need me to tell you that it's so frustrating to be halfway through a picture and realise that something is drastically off about it, and that you might have picked up on it if you just used all the resources available and spent the extra time on it to check. So do use that extra time, be patient because it will all pay off. Tip number three is comparison. Compare your drawing with the reference photo throughout the entire process. Half of the time I spend drawing, perhaps more, is actually spent looking at the reference. With realism, I try and capture as much visible information from the picture as possible, and it would be incredibly difficult to try and memorise everything, even for just one small area. What I do is I look at my reference photo, take a piece of visual information, so for example either colour, location, length or angle, and put it onto paper. Then I'll look back at the reference photo to check if I've drawn it correctly, and if not I'll adjust it. And I apply this process to every tiny line, shape or transition I see in the photo. 
I really recommend having your drawing and reference visible at the same angle or plane. So for example, if you're working flat, um, have a printout of the reference laying next to your drawing or have it visible on your phone or tablet laying next to your work. And I found that this reduces the chance of my work being distorted. I also recommend having your picture, your reference photo that is, um, digital as this allows you to zoom in, but I also find that colour tends to be better represented on a screen than on a piece of paper, unless perhaps you have a really nice printer. <laughs> For me personally, I have my reference photo up on my computer screen in front of me, but also because I record the process of my drawing, I have the live camera footage of my drawing up on my screen right next to my reference. It's also important to look at and evaluate your work without comparing it to the reference, because it can be easy to get absorbed and overwhelmed by a small difference between your drawing and your reference photo. And this could be something that would not look wrong or out of place unless the viewer was looking at them side by side, and I'm sure in the majority of cases your work will not be displayed next to your reference image. Tip number four is about mindset. Expect the majority of the process to be about making adjustments, don't set out to perfectly capture the subject in your first layer or first line. Make a start and then slowly refine a piece towards the goal that you want. So in the context of this horse drawing, I lightly blocked in the general colour I wanted the skin or fur to be in a small location, and then I looked to see where things needed to be lighter or darker and adjusted the base colour accordingly. I didn't try to get the exact colour straight away. Similarly, if you're sketching, if your line isn't quite right, try drawing it again before you erase it entirely. Compare and try and see at what point the line isn't right and adjust just that part. I have often seen somebody draw something and when one tiny part isn't quite right, they'll erase the entire thing. And that's such a long-winded path to take with your artwork and I can see that it's a quick road to frustration and burnout. My fifth piece of advice is to focus on your values. A value is how light or dark something is, and this is really important to describe form. A really easy way to check your values in comparison to your reference is to make a grayscale version of your reference photo, and take a well-lit photo of your artwork and also convert that to black and white. And then you can, can um, compare the two side by side. You can also make something called a value finder, and I'll leave a good pre-made one I found in the description box down below, but it's essentially just a chart of grey tones ranging from white to black. You then hold up your little chart to an area on your grayscale reference photo, and then you can move your strip up or down until your values match, or are as close as possible. And then you can take that to your drawing and colour the area until it matches that point on your value finder. On a similar note, we have uh, number six, which is about contrast. Be conscious of the contrast in your work and reference photo. A common mistake is to not go dark enough, and as a result, you lose out on a large chunk of your potential range of values, which will make it really difficult to convincingly portray a form. Think of it as trying to shade a sphere with just two medium grey values, instead of having ten that range from very dark to very light. Having a good range from bright to dark is what defines the contrast of a piece and makes an image look more interesting and attention grabbing. But also make sure to reserve your darkest and lightest shades for very exclusive areas. So for example, imagine that you are drawing an eye in grayscale. The white of the eye isn't going to be as white as the paper, it's often darker than one would expect actually, but on the other hand, the reflection in the eye might be a bright white. And on a similar note, the pupil might not be the blackest black throughout, and perhaps only the area that's not covered by a reflection might be um, as black as you can go, and the rest might be, be um, varying shades of dark grey. I find a quick way to detect contrast in a piece is to squint. It'll make clear what areas are the brightest and darkest and where they are placed in respect to one another. Being strategic about your use of tone will make it easier to uh, convey the form in a more detailed and refined way. My seventh tip builds on the idea of value that we covered in tip number five, and it's to define form by changes in value rather than outline. 
Nothing in life is outlined, but instead an object might appear to have solid boundaries because of the difference of its value compared to the object that it touches. Back to the example of drawing an eye. The difference between the eyeball and the eyelid isn't a harsh barrier, but it will be a crisp difference in value. The white of the eye is most likely going to be lighter than the edge of the eyelid. Additionally, remember to erase your sketch as much as possible before you start colouring or shading, so it's just barely visible, or be sure to add enough layers over the top of your sketch so that it disappears entirely. Remember to cover over the lines as you go, rather than colour up to the edge of them like you would in a colouring book. Building on this idea, consider that uh, things like wrinkles in skin or veins on a leaf aren't just a line of a single value. These are structures that have form too, and they also interact with the surfaces nearby them. So value should also be used to describe them. So in the example of a leaf vein, the highest point of the leaf vein might be the lightest and the sides may be slightly darker. Where the leaf vein meets the flat surface of the leaf, a shadow might be cast. And when drawing a wrinkle on skin, it's not a hard line, but a quick gradient between the flat surface of the skin and the wrinkle. Paying attention to these things will help better portray form, and reduce the appearance that the details are just drawn onto the subject rather than actually being a part of it. My eighth tip is about colour and choosing the right ones. So first of all, don't get hung up about choosing the perfect hue. How dark the colour is, also known as value, is more important than if it's too red, yellow or blue. I also want to quickly say that there is no one size fits all colour for a particular subject matter or material, for example skin. This will all depend on lighting. Anyway, if you want to more accurately choose colour, make sure that you have your colours swatched out already. I'll often pick up my swatch sheet and hold it near my reference photo, so I can see which colour uh, pencil or whatever I'm using is the closest match to that area on my subject matter. If I don't have the exact colour, which is most likely the case, I'll choose one that's a little lighter and add another colour over the top to make it darker or to adjust the hue. I'd also recommend making use of a digital colour picking tool. So for example, I'll often have my reference photo open in a program such as Microsoft Paint, and I'll use the eyedropper tool to select an area where I'm a bit unsure about the colour. I'll then make a swatch of that colour next to the photograph on a blank area of the virtual canvas, and it'll make it easier to see what the colour actually looks like out of context. It can be really hard to know exactly what colour something is when it's in context with other colours and lighting. Think back to the infamous white and gold or black and blue dress. Or an even better example is a more recent uh, edited photo which clearly depicts bright red strawberries even though no red pixels were used in the image. Once again, I'll leave links below to the images I'm talking about if you're unfamiliar with them, or you can also google the term colour constancy. Anyway, I digress, I find this all too interesting, um, but you can also use the digital swatching method to compare the same areas between your drawing and reference to see where you need to adjust. Just make sure that the photo that you take of your drawing to compare is well lit in neutral coloured lighting so that the colours in the photo are a true reflection of reality. My ninth tip is all about nuances of colour. For realistic work, it's important to vary the hue of the colour that you use. So by that I mean how red, blue or yellow something is, and not just vary the colour's saturation or value. So for example, a fruit like a banana isn't just one kind of yellow, and the highlights aren't just white mixed with that yellow, and the shadows aren't just black mixed with that yellow. For example, in warm coloured light, blue is often present in the shadows, and reds and yellows in the highlights. Reflected light is also worth thinking about, so what coloured objects are nearby your subject matter, or what colour is illuminating your subject? So, as an example, I consider reflected light a lot when drawing fur, particularly black or white fur. Blue is often the colour of choice that I use when I'm colouring black fur, as the blue from the sky has an effect on the fur colour. 
However, it's really important to be subtle about these additional colours in most scenarios. I recommend using glazing techniques to add just a hint of the nuanced colour over your base colour. And last, but certainly not least, is number 10, which is about detail and focus. This news might come to a relief to some, you don't need to stress over the details. Highly detailed is not synonymous with realistic. It's not the same thing, you can make something look realistic without it being very detailed at all. Building on this, the way human vision works is that only the very centre of our vision captures fine details. So to create realistic looking work, the whole piece doesn't need to be intricate, in fact this can often detract from the sense of realism in a piece. With portraiture, the eyes are often the focus of a piece, so those are the things that I usually uh, make sure are most detailed and full of contrast, and the further away from the focus things are, the less detail I'll put in. Similarly, things that are further away from us we see with less detail, especially if our eyes are focused on something much closer to us. This is why that if you have a background in your drawing, it might be a good idea to have it blurry and out of focus, and that will really help to push your detailed subject matter forwards. Okay, so that's all the tips that I have for now. Let me know which ones you found most useful, or if you have any tips of your own. I'd love to hear them in the comment section down below. Remember that I'll be uploading another video using this video footage, where I'll explain the process of my piece. And here's the finished piece. I'm really pleased with the outcome, and there's something about it that feels different to my usual work. But I can't quite put my finger on it, so let me know what you think. I hope that you enjoyed this video and found it interesting and helpful. Leave it a like if you did. Don't forget to subscribe if you'd like to see more tutorials, challenges, reviews, and art advice videos. Thank you very much for watching, hope you have a lovely week, and I'll see you in the next video!